Hi, my name is Vic Veer. I'm an ENT surgeon at the Royal National ENT Hospital in Central London, UK. My job on the NHS is to provide surgical care for people with snoring and sleep apnea. And what I want to do today is review this device. This is called the Genio System by Nixua, and it's a device that helps people with moderate or severe obstructive sleep apnea. So what I'll start off with is to explain how it works and how it stops snoring and sleep apnea and then I'll explain the medical evidence behind it and at the end I'll talk to you about my opinions and impressions about this device. Now I, I should mention that um, the people who made this device, Nixo, a company from Belgium, they haven't paid me for this video at all. These are my own opinions and impressions about this device but I ought to mention that I'm actively trying to work with the Royal National ENT Hospital, University College Hospitals and also the surrounding commissioners in the NHS to provide this device free on the NHS for anyone who has this problem in this, uh, in this country in Britain. So uh, hopefully this will be available free to all soon. Now uh, before I get started, because of the YouTube algorithm I'd really appreciate it if you were to like and uh, subscribe to my channel. It really helps me build more content and provide better quality videos for you. Now to understand how this device works, you need to understand a little bit of anatomy. Firstly, it works on the hypoglossal nerve. The hypoglossal nerve is a nerve, uh, there's a right and left one, and they come down from your brain, underneath your chin, and up into your tongue, just about here. It's called hypoglossal because it's hypo, underneath, that's what hypo means, and glossal is another word we use for tongue. So what this device does is that it sits underneath the skin just about here it touches the two hypoglossal nerves as they go towards the tongue and one of the functions of the hypoglossal nerve is to bring your tongue forward it drags it forward like that and by doing that it opens up the back of the airway so that you don't get sleep apnea and snoring so who is this device used for now the genio system by Nixua is mainly used for people with moderate or severe sleep apnea particularly those who have tried but failed to be able to use CPAP or a mandibular advancement device in this country. Now, if you don't know what sleep apnea is, there's lots of information on my website, which is consultantsurgeonco.uk, or if you look on my YouTube channel, there'll be plenty of other videos that you can look at. Basically, what obstructive sleep apnea is, is when you lie down at night, you go to sleep, and because uh, the airway collapses down in these people, it collapses down so much that you can't breathe and because you can't breathe the heart has to work very much harder the lungs have to work harder and this has a consequence of causing problems with heart disease strokes heart attacks diabetes high blood pressure so it's an important condition that not many people know about so obviously this little chip needs to be implanted within the neck so just underneath the skin here just above those two hypoglossal nerves so you'll have a cut which is just across here. This chip is implanted inside and the whole operation takes about 30 to 60 minutes to achieve. You can go home the same day. So as you can see this microchip is quite small and the idea is that because it's got a very soft plastic over it you shouldn't be able to feel it when it's inside your neck uh, and you can just about forget about it. The difference between this hypoglossal nerve stimulator and the other ones on the market is that this isn't implanted with a battery. The other uh, stimulators on the market have a battery that's implanted with the microchip. So to charge the uh, microchip at night you need to use a battery and this is the battery that Nixwell provide. This battery powers the microchip at night and what it does is, is it sits just underneath your chin like this and you have to wear this whilst you're sleeping each night. Now, there are no needles or any other invasive way of powering the microchip. It just works wirelessly through the skin. To charge this battery, what you need to do is get this charger that uh, Nixwa provide, and you just plug it in. And with, uh, you put this in the wall socket and just charge it over the day. Now, to use this battery at night, you need to be able to keep it close to your chin and so it can charge the uh, microchip underneath the skin. The way it does this is by using this sticker. So you have to wear this sticker every night. So you put this sticker on at night and then you put this like that with the sticker 
and so that way the battery can wirelessly charge your microchip because there's only a short distance between the two. Now Nick will say that you can't really have a beard when you're using the sticker because it doesn't keep it stuck there. So obviously if you have a very large beard this won't, won't be anywhere near your chin and therefore you won't be able to power the microchip. But if you have a much smaller trimmed beard like I do, I think it's all right. And look, I'll show you how this works. You can just get the sticker, put it on underneath like this. I think you can uh, have a goatee as well. And just leave it like that. And as long as it sticks, it'll sit there and charging all night. The only problem is when you take this off in the morning, ow, it's kind of painful. You may lose a little bit of hair taking it out. So I can appreciate that uh, having a beard and not being able to use this is a minor problem. But I'm a 21st century guy and my wife has told me I have to wear a beard. So uh, I can assure you, you can have at least a little bit of a beard um, and it should be fine. Now, one of the advantages of not having a battery is that uh, if you have it implanted, after about 10 years that battery will just start dying and you'd have to have that replaced. With this system, you do have to wear the sticky on every night, and the sticky plus has to sit there every night, but at least you don't have to have another operation every 10 years to get it to work. Now, another thing to mention is that this battery needs to be three and a half centimeters from the microchip for it to be able to power it wirelessly. Now, if you have uh, a lot of fat underneath your chin, this will make the distance too large and therefore it wouldn't work. The advantage, however, is just that um, during the operation I could just remove that fat and then it will sit a little bit closer. So you could guess, you could call it a neck liposuction or something like that. So what I'm going to do now is show you a video of someone who's had the implant and you can see how the tongue is protruding forward every time the, uh, the chip activates. This is quite an extreme version of this. And I suspect that it won't be so stimulated in this person at night. What we need to do at night is titrate how much energy goes into those hypoglossal nerves. You don't want the tongue to go forward so much that it wakes you up at night and that becomes rather irritating. However, you want it to come forward enough so that you can sleep and not have sleep apnea. And this is a video from inside the throat. So you're looking down from the nose down into the throat. That little V-shaped thing that you can see there is the voice box and the, the big lump that comes um, up on the screen, that's the back of the tongue falling back. And when the implant is activated, the tongue gets shifted forward or, or down uh, on this video. And you can see how it opens up the airway, stops you from having sleep apnea. So now that you've seen how this device works, what I want to do is talk to you about the medical evidence for this device. So the first paper was written in a medical journal called Laryngoscope. This is an excellent journal and it's a case study. Now a case study means it's basically one person and the, uh, the experience they had with that first patient. So the patient that they found was a six-year-old woman with a moderate obstructive sleep apnea and you can see from this result that she went from an AHI of 24.6 down to an AHI of 1.3 with the implant. Now as you can expect with a paper of this sort, uh, the people who have these interventions do extremely well. And if you don't exactly know what an AHI means, it, AHI is the number of times that you stop breathing every hour. A bit of context for you, less than five AHI, so less than five times an hour that you stop breathing, that's considered within the normal limits. Five to 15, so up to 15 times an hour stopping breathing, that's considered mild obstructive sleep apnea. 15 to 30 is considered moderate obstructive sleep apnea and greater than 30 times every hour is considered severe. Now this lady had 24 and then after the operation, after the implant's been turned on, she dropped down to 1.3, so well within the normal range. So she had an excellent, excellent result. If you look at these two graphs before and after the implant, you can see also her snoring got better you can see the wiggly lines with the snoring or the, the loudness, that's got better. And so she's had a great result and you'd expect a great result in a case study like this. They're showing off how well the device has helped this person. She has been effectively cured from her snoring and sleep apnea. So the next paper I want to talk to you about is this paper which is much bigger. This is for 22 patients over eight different hospitals between France and Australia. 
Now I'll be happy to talk to you about the the, the study methodology etc but it's rather boring and what I'll do is I'll go straight on to the results. This paper is freely available on the internet if you'd like to have a look at it over a cup of Horlicks or something. Anyway, moving straight on, here are the results. And this is another table, a bit like what we saw before, with the results before and after of all the patients. And it's an average of all the patients this time. So on average, patients were 50% improved with this implant. Now, it may not seem quite as good as the last paper, but if you imagine using CPAP, that's the sort of thing we would expect to see with someone using CPAP well. The reason why I say that is that CPAP, which is the mask that goes on your face, whilst you're using the CPAP mask, you'll see AHI results down to 0 0.2, 0 0.1, almost zero. And that's great, but most people can't use CPAP through the whole night. They can only use it for about four hours, 70% of the time. Now, that equates to about two and a half 2.9 hours each night. Now when you take the mask off in the middle of the night and carry on sleeping like you normally do, you then go back to your normal um, AHI which is approximately 24 in most of these cases. So if you average those two out, on average most people who are using CPAP well have an AHI with, including their total sleep time of about uh, 11, 10 to 11. So bringing people down to about 10 that's an excellent result and what you'd expect to see with someone who's using CPAP well. The other reason why this result is good is because you've gone from an AHI of 20 down to 10 and what that means is that you no longer need to use your CPAP machine anymore uh, and that's what most people would rather not do. Some people who end up going for an operation like this are so intolerant of having a mask on their face they would rather have an implant to avoid that. So now going back to this paper, I'll show you some graphs that they've also provided. Now this one is about the AHI, you can see on the left it goes from pre-operation, before the implant, and then afterwards down to what it was like after the operation. And in this graph we look at the ODI, the one that is slightly more representative, we think, of obstructive sleep apnea in terms of how patients feel. So you can see that the majority of people who had the implant got better after having the implant. Uh, even after six months of using it. If you look carefully at these uh, graphs, however, I'm a bit surprised by some of the results. You can see at the lower end of the graph that some of these people didn't seem to have sleep apnea at all. Some of them were less than five. So I'm not entirely sure what's going on here. And honestly, I don't really understand how this could be true because they'll be therefore implanting people who didn't have sleep apnea. And that doesn't make any sense to me. I'm assuming it's a mistake. And so therefore, implanting someone who doesn't have sleep apnea with an implant that's meant to stop sleep apnea, well you're not going to get much benefit and you can see those people who are less than five, the line is almost flat, whereas the higher up you go with the higher HI you see a much bigger fall. So even though they seem to implant some people who weren't quite as bad as what we'd expect to be using this implant for, they still had quite good results. So, as I said before, the average HI dropped from 20 down to 10. And the results of these implants are similar to what you'd see with other hypoglossal nerve implants out there. Now, the good thing about this paper is that it also talks about the side effects and the problems that occurred with this implant. Now, three people didn't manage to use the implant because they got infected. It seems that most of these people who got infected were from the same hospital. So, out of the 22 people who finished the trial, 30% of people had painful or a difficulty with swallowing and 26% of people had difficulty with speaking. 19% of people had a blood clot around the implant and a further 19% of people had bruising around the area after the operation. 11% of people after the operation noticed that when the tongue was protruded forward with, when the stimulator was turned on, the tongue used to rub against some of their teeth and that caused some ulcers there. Also, some people had some pain when the tongue got pulled forward. Another 11% of people had evidence that the hypoglossal nerve was damaged during the operation. On saying that, it seems like quite a high number, but actually most of these problems all got better. So, for example, the damage to the nerve, the nerve repaired itself and that was fine. And you can imagine uh, when you touch a nerve or you um, operate near a nerve, it's like falling asleep on your arm. When you wake up in the morning, it takes a bit of time for that nerve to start working again. It's the same thing that happens with most nerves that we operate on. For a short time, they may not work particularly well. It doesn't mean that you can't eat or drink, 
but it does make it slightly more difficult whilst the nerve is repairing itself. I presume also that the people who have problems with their tongue, with it rubbing against their tongue, they changed the stimulation level on the microchip so it didn't cause so much damage rubbing against the teeth or hurting when the tongue was pulled forward. What I did notice from the study is that they said that 30% of people had trouble with the, the sticky stuff on their skin. Some people are quite sensitive to sticky plasters and I think it's the glue that they're sensitive to. Now again, although it says 30% of people had problems, at the end of the trial only one person still had a problem with the sticky plaster that you use underneath your chin. It might be worth if you're considering this is to use one of these stickies and stick it on at night just to see if you have a sensitivity to it. Now in the trial they said that with these people who are slightly sensitive they gave them some uh, emollient creams, moisturisers and things like that and this problem soon resolved itself. But there was one person that continued to have problems even after six months. So in conclusion I think this implant is, is a really good idea. There's lots of differences to the other implants available on the market. Firstly, it sits just here, it's quite small, it's not obtrusive, it works on both the nerves at the same time, both hypoglossal nerves. So with some of the other implants, they only work on one nerve and your tongue twists around and it's in your mouth at night and that can wake people up. Whereas you can put a little less stimulation on your tongue and bring it out equally on both sides. So that's really good having a bilateral nerve stimulation. It also doesn't uh, involve having a battery inside there, so you're not encumbered with this battery, which after 10 years you need to remove with another operation and replace it. It does, however, mean that you need to charge up a battery every night and stick it under your chin, so it's not completely sort of hands-free like the other implants. So I think that we need more studies to prove that this works really well, and I think it will show it. Uh, if you look at uh, hypoglossal nerve implants from around the world, for example the Inspire device, they've had 8,500 implants implanted around the world, particularly in America. And I think this implant will really help the overall landscape of implants in obstructive sleep apnea. So, like I said at the start of the video, I'm trying to get this implant available for everyone in Britain free on the NHS. So thank you very much for watching, I hope you found this video informative. Please do press the like button and subscribe to my channel. It helps me grow this YouTube channel and tell more people about snoring and sleep apnea. Thank you very much.